Hi there, I'm Diego Martinez, and this is Tunes, a podcast about the songs we vibe to. As you know, we go behind the groove and dedicate each episode to the context and longevity of an underrated music anthem, with commentary from its producers, songwriters, arrangers, and performers, the Tune Architects. In this episode, we'll hear from singer and composer Sharon Brown and her memories of her 1982 transatlantic dance hit, I Specialize in Love. I'm in a state of gratitude for all the people that was behind Specialized in Love when it started. We had no idea it was going to be a hit, but a certain amount of people came together, unknown artists, unknown record company, an unknown management company, unknown songwriters, just everybody unknown on the public level. But in the industry, we knew each other. We knew what we were doing over at CBS, what we did over here, stuff like that. That's how I found I Specialize in Love. Sharon Brown's one of the most detailed and riveting stories we featured in this podcast so far. It's a cautionary tale of the highs and lows of the music biz. And you'll soon find out why. Even though her most remembered song is loved by audiences from all over the world for almost four decades, she's had very few opportunities to speak her mind about the experiences that defined her time in the industry, all of which culminated with the release of A Specialized in Love, a song that is so identifiable with the sound of 1982 New York post disco and the marriage between classic R&B, electronics, and rap. Many people played key roles in the track's legend status, but Sharon's sultry and graceful vocals are like the icing on the cake. Whether you heard it on roller skating rinks, underground gay clubs, and block parties, you couldn't escape I Specialize. It was a great introduction to Brown as a solo artist, but to be fair, she had been grooming herself almost from birth. As the daughter of drummer William Brown, who's played with the Isley Brothers and sax player Cannonball Adderley, and the niece of Twist and Shout songwriter Phil Medley, the Harlem born was bound to follow on the family trade and develop her own voice in a household filled with different sounds. I remember being under nine, eight, seven. I'm laying on the floor in my parents' living room. There's no TV, there's a radio. Early 50s, listening to music. My dad, all the time, had music playing in the house. My mom always sang, my dad was a drummer. So we're listening to music all the time and they had records, not 33s, 78s. And we had a little uh, Victrola where we could play the records. And my father was heavily into rhythm. So most of the music I listened to was salsa, mambo. You know, it was Latin. I grew up on Latino music. It was, you know, Tito Puentes and, and, and you know, stuff like that. And, and my father loved drums. So Escovito, I think it was Sheila East's father. My father was into drums completely. So that's how it started. But then he was also into heavily into jazz. I wish you bluebirds in the spring. My vocalist that I started listening to as a little girl was Gloria Lynn, Billie Holiday, Sarah Vaughan. And some of those people were friends of my father. My father hung out with these people and played with these people, you know, those little jip joints in New York. So when I became like 11 and 12, my father had a band and my uncle was on keyboards. My father was on drums and they asked me to be the vocalist and I did, but we were singing jazz. And, and my first song was Bye Bye Blackbird. I knew a man who jangles and he danced for you. My dad had a very important part in my life with this music thing because he took me to the Apollo Theater and we went to see Sammy Davis Jr., Red Fox, Nipsey Russell, and 
and I think Della Reese was there, I'm not sure. But what stood out in my mind was Sammy Davis Jr. He did his routine and he was a, such a small man and he had on a gun holster with two guns because he liked the cowboys and stuff and had on a cowboy hat and he wiggled himself out of the holster. He didn't have to unbuckle it or anything, he was that small, he just wiggled his way out. And he had the audience so engrossed and so, everybody was so into it. And I remember sitting there with my dad saying to myself, I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna be on that stage. I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna make people laugh and feel good like that. I'm gonna do that, Daddy. I'm gonna do that. Sharon did achieve her dream of standing on stage at the world famous Apollo Theater, where she auditioned for the amateur night with a group she formed in high school. Although they placed third, her aspirations were dead set on a career as a performer. Those aspirations, however, took a back seat as trouble loomed in her household. Her parents split, and Sharon moved with her mom to Massachusetts. She became a young mother herself at age 17, and to make ends meet, she resumed her singing career in local venues at the suggestion of her friends. Brown also developed a strong knack for writing lyrics. Her first professional songwriting gig came around as she brazenly walked through the offices of CVS Records in Manhattan, looking for someone to give her an opportunity to shine. I stuck my head in the door and I saw this black guy sitting at the control booth. And he looked at me and says, can I help you? I said, I hope so. My name is Sharon Brown. I'm a singer-songwriter. He said, you are? I said, yeah. He said, come here. I go in, I look in the booth. I see all these white guys in there in a band. They're playing and stuff. I said, who's that? He said, that's blood, sweat, and tears. I said, oh, oh my God, for real? So he stopped the session. He says, hey, come on, guys, come out here. I want you to meet somebody who just came in and bum rushed the session. She says she's a singer-songwriter. So they came out, Bobby Columbia, the drummer for Blood, Sweat, and Tears, comes up to me wearing his Star David. I had a Star David on as well. So he says, I hear you're a singer-songwriter. I said, I am. They put a track on. I hear the track. He said, you think you can write some lyrics to this? We calling it Love Looks Good On You. I said, well, absolutely. They gave me the track. I went home. I went upstairs and I started writing my tail off. I'm writing these lyrics and I'm writing these lyrics and I'm singing a melody. The melody gets locked. The lyric is locked. I said, Daddy, listen to this. And a producer. As a freelance writer for CBS Records, Sharon Brown penned lyrics for other artists, such as Ronnie Dyson and Sly Stone. During this period, she would also receive first hand knowledge from major industry players like Motown executive Gwen Gordy, record producers Norman Whitfield and Hank Cosby, and the godfather of soul, James Brown who saw something of true value in Sharon's ability as a producer, composer, and arranger. The first person that took me to New York City to get a record deal was James Brown. I mean, that's my godfather for real. <laughs> when James brought me to New York and, and got me with the, the management, um, even then, as a young girl, I knew that the management wouldn't be right. So we didn't sign with them. And James just told me not to worry. You're going to make it. You know why you're going to make it? I said, why, Mr. Brown? Because you're a Brown. I said, oh, my God. But um, he was right because um, years later, I did have a record in my name, Brown. I, I, I tell you, it's been so many different little incidents that happened with different um, people in this, on this journey. Uh, I learned how to write lyrics through Curtis Mayfield. Um, it started out as love letters just love letters and, and, and the guys in the band would laugh at my letters, but um, I learned from that how to write my heart, but write it in a rhythm and rhyme. And then um, meter, 
I studied from a lot of people and I learned how to produce my own music when I was in California working with Norman Whitfield because I loved the Motown era. I loved Motown. And when I was able to become part of that family, that was awesome for me. But when I got there, Norman was leaving Motown and he gave me a choice. I'll either sign you to Motown or you can leave with me because I'm starting my own company, Fort Knox. I chose to leave with Norman. Because at the time I saw what was going on at Motown, it was kind of crazy for me to be there. I would get so lost. I would get soaked right up. And as long as Norman was able to see my talent and was willing to work with me, I thought the best choice was to leave with Norman when he left Motown. So I did. And um, that's how we produced the um, song that's out on, on all the uh, platforms and YouTube called Family Tree. Tell you a story. That was my first underground hit, which is why I got specialized, because they heard that song. I, I'm singing all the vocals on it, and um, I'm playing keyboards on it, and um, I recorded and produced it myself at Fort Knox under Norman Whitfield's direction, because he said that I, I didn't need a producer. You don't need a producer, and you don't need a writer. You just need the time to sit down and do it. Now, here's the tools, and he gave me the tools to do it. The funky single, Family Tree released in 1975 on the Tiny Ananda label, became a staple of England's Northern Soul club scene and inspired DJs like Norman Cook, a.k.a. Fatboy Slim, who rediscovered and remixed the track in 2001. Sharon says that to this day, she hasn't received any payments from Cook's release of Family Tree. That DJ, uh, what's his name? That boy, yeah, him. He's a thief. He owes us. He took that track. He found it. He found the underground record, thought it was hot, and he mixed it. Remixed it, put it out with his name, Norman Cook, Family Tree. I've never been paid for that. He never licensed it from us, nothing. And then when we did contact Harry Fox, they shut us down because, you know, he's a favorite fat boy. So I left that alone. You know, maybe one day my kids will do it or... Maybe the other writer with me will do it. I don't know. But right now, backtracking and going over to try to fight for my rights, um, I'm at the point where, well, okay, you did that, but you won't get any more music from us. We won't give you any more music. We just won't do it. It seemed that Sharon Brown was finally starting to receive the recognition she deserved within the record industry. But there was more to come. The opportunity of a lifetime was waiting for her in the Big Apple. She found herself inside her car eating a meatball sub with her first child when her then-husband spotted an ad on the industry newspaper backstage. He comes across this ad. It says, tall, black, willowy-voiced female needed for demo session, possibly a release. He said, well, you're tall, you're black, and you're willowy. Let's go. Call these people. I said, I don't want no record deal out the newspaper. He said, well, call him anyway. You don't know, it might lead to something else. So I, get, I didn't want to get out of the car for the one reason. When I returned to New York with my husband and my baby, I was shell-shocked. I was afraid of people. Every time I was on the subway, some idiot would bother me. It got to the point where I was afraid to be out public. So I stayed with my husband and he would drive me everywhere and we would be together, but I wouldn't go anywhere by myself. He sits in the car watching me because he knows I'm fearful about getting out the car. I get out the car, I'm looking up and down the street, up and down 6th Avenue. I go to the phone booth, I dial the number, which was Plateau Records, Eddie O'Loughlin, and I'm talking on the phone, and he says, well, do you have your music? Come in such and such a time the next day. So I hang the phone up, and I see down the street there's this white guy, he's a bum, walking up the street, but he caught my eye contact. And he walked up to me and he said to me, give me some money. And I got scared, I still got the phone in my hand. He, I said, I don't have any money. And he said, I said, give me some money. He jumps right in my face and all of a sudden I snapped. And I took the phone receiver and I said, if you don't get away from me, I'll beat you down to the ground, blah, blah, blah. And the man jumped back, he says, take it easy, lady. And I look, my husband's in the car laughing his head off. He's just laughing. So I get in the car. I said, I told you I didn't want to get out there. You see, I told you every time I get out there, somebody comes and bother me. He said, but no, Sharon, you don't see what's happened. You see how you, tell, you, you dealt with that man? I said, yeah. He said, you're ready. And that's what it was. We turned the car around because I didn't have my music. My music was in Massachusetts. So we turned the car around. My husband drove back to Massachusetts, got my tapes out of the storage, 
turned back around. He took out a leather jacket, leather pants, and leather boots and told me to change into that. And I changed in the car on 57th Street. I put the boots on, the leather pants, the leather jacket. My hair was very long then. I was very thin. The heels made me look like a giant. I was very statuesque. And I walked into Profile and I owned it. I walked into Plateau. I owned it. And that's what they said. You are it. We heard about your family tree over at CBS. But, you know, the look, you got it. We're going to sign you. We want you to do it. With the recommendation from CBS Records, Sharon was signed to a management deal and a chance to record with a fledging New York label, Profile Records, founded by Corey Robbins in 1981. Profile had already experienced some minor success with Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde's genius rap. Now it had teamed up with Carol Douglas producer, Eddie O'Loughlin, to cut a record written by Richard Scherr and Sitzi's cult icon, Lottie Golden. It was part of a four-track demo Brown was set to lay in the recording studio. It was four songs. I Specialize in Love, C'est La Vie by Chuck Berry, Down on the Corner by Creedence Clearwater, and, oh, a song called Love Don't Hurt People, and I think Sissy Whitney Houston's mother recorded it first, and it was a hit overseas, and someone got the right idea that it would be a good remake for me. And I did the four demos, and... Um, Nothing happened for a while. We heard nothing. And um, Eddie O'Loughlin decided he would send the master over to, what was it? No, my management did it. Management took the master and gave it to Vanguard Records, Michael Wilkinson, to do an upbeat mix because it was so bland in the beginning, the way we had recorded it. So I was called into Vanguard and I went down that evening with my husband and um, Andy Schwartz. He's the keyboarder from um, Chic. He plays keyboard for Chic. He was also the arranger for Specialized. He's a keyboardist also. That's Andy. We tried to uh, get a nice vibe, nice R&B vibe on the record because it, at the point where it was, it was very pop, very, very pop. And uh, I don't know whose idea it was to make it more R&B, but that's what we did that evening at Vanguard Studios, where I put the tag on the end of the song, where I'm moaning, I can make you feel brand new. You know, the whole ending of the song was just ad libs off the top of my head. The moaning and the R&B approach was a nice touch, but it still wasn't enough to set the clubs on fire. Someone suggested taking the track to DJ Remitzer and Dance Music Hall of Famer, T. Scott. I met him. He let me hear the song after he had put his magic on it, and it was absolutely perfect. There was just, just nothing else to do to it, but release it. It's perfect. And uh, we were happy about it. And a couple of DJs, because of T. Scott, decided to book me in different clubs to, you know, get me some exposure as a new artist. So the first club I played was Zanzibar in New Jersey. That was really the first time I had ever really been on the stage with a professional hit record and, you know, as a professional artist. And it was really wild for me. But uh, we kept going, kept going. And, and we kind of picked up a little bit of steam in New York and in the States, but not what we were looking for. So Eddie O'Loughlin sent it over to Richard Branson, Virgin Records. And Richard Branson and Virgin took it. It became a, a hit in the UK, Amsterdam, all over the world, South Africa. It just, just exploded. New York, actually, my hometown, had to catch up. I'm an import. Actually, I'm a New Yorker, but I'm an import because they had to import the record back from the UK to the States. After the single for I Specialize in Love traveled back to America from across the pond, it enjoyed a three-week run at number two on Billboard's Hot Dance Club chart and a top 40 placing in the UK. The Virgin Records issue of the 12-inch single was the only one featuring Sharon's face on the cover. Profile and her management set up a photo shoot to introduce her to the public. 
what followed was a terrifying experience that tested her mellow and spiritual strength. I see the photographer. He's this white guy with this real bushy red, red, real red hair and blue squinchy eyes, but scruffy hair all over his face. And he kept smiling, right? So when it was time for me to sit before the camera, you see the picture. I'm just looking into the picture. I'm looking into the camera. I'm just looking into it because I had to protect my soul. The photographer kept smiling at me. All of a sudden, I needed to pose certain ways, certain positions. I had to disrobe certain things, bring down this. Bring, well, t- well, why don't you just do from your waist up nude? I wouldn't. If you look at that picture again, you will see I was completely in the spirit of divine protection. And I just looked into the camera. I was looking at the devil. That's what was in my heart. I kid you not, I've never told this story to anyone. I felt in my heart, I was looking at the devil. I couldn't understand the frequency whatsoever. It was so dark, cold even. And I really felt bad to even show my shoulders. I felt violated. I felt humiliated. And that was the last photo shoot that I did under contract with anyone. Sharon says her record company and her management were adamant in creating an image for her, one that was more akin to Donna Summer's early love to love you baby, goddess of love persona, that clearly wasn't her. That image was light years away from the perception people have of I specialize in love, an invitation for a deeper connection than just sexual. Now, the image. We want you to be the sexiest woman alive. Every man and woman wants you. They were going a whole different, raunchy way. The way it got back to the way you perceive the lyric is when I had to perform live. I refuse to be a hoe. I refuse to be Bojangles dancing for the money. I refused. I just refused, and I took it to the people. So I would always speak before I sang the song. When the intro would come in, I'd always say to the people, what I want you to do is to make a promise to me, make a promise to yourselves, and to make a promise to the one almighty that you will always specialize in love. I want you to repeat after me. I promise to specialize in love. And it gets in you, and it raises it, raise it up to where I'm bursting with love, and then we get into the song. And I want you to know this is about you. This is your song. This is about us. Love yourselves. It'll be easy to love any and everybody else once you are okay with you. You ain't gotta worry about it, it falls into place. Love yourself. You've got a mighty gift on your hands. It's called life, temple. Take care of it. That's where I'm at. I Specialize in Love gave Profile Records its first international dance hit. At a certain point, it was the most requested song in the clubs from Manhattan and Chicago to London and Amsterdam. For a label that was just getting its feet wet, the global success of the track caught them entirely by surprise, to the point of not being sure how to properly follow it. Unfortunately, the New York-based family was not ready for a hit record, did not know what to do after the record hit. They didn't expect the record to hit. And when it hit, it shocked them. Now they're fighting about who's going to get credit for this, who's going to get credit for that. She needs another record. And they could never, ever come up with another record. I had music, but they didn't want me to be independent. They would not. They refused to use my music, even though Family Tree was my song. And Ronnie Bishop, who wrote the song with me, that's how I got in. You, you saw my ability on that, but yet you will not let me be independent. So we never could get a hit record. Time went on, and that's when I just took it uh, upon myself and my lawyers. And I went to Europe, and I worked as long as I could on my own with Lighthouse Agency over there, and they put me on a 30-day tour. I didn't have to split the money this time with management or the booking agents or anything. It was all straight cash, and a lot of people were upset about that. In 1983, after she broke ranks with the team that brought her to fame, Sharon returned to the States and started working on songs for an album with specialized arranger Andy Schwartz. When she got word of some startling news, she was going to be the recipient of a Rhythm and Blues Award for Best New Female Artist of the Year. At a televised ceremony 
held in the now extinct Imperial Plaza Hotel in Las Vegas. With the way things had turned sour with Profile Records and her management, and their inability to follow the success of I Specialize in Love, this almost felt like a joke to Sharon. To make matters worse, she had no money to travel to Vegas and accept her word, and had to hitchhike her way from the airport to the site of the ceremony. Once she got there, she found herself in a sea of stars like Esther Phillips, Frida Payne, Millie Jackson, M. Toomey, and Betty Wright. She was also caught in production mix-ups that almost hurt her performance that night. Not only did she manage to pull through, but she tore the house down with an electric live performance. The event and its exposure on a nationwide broadcast via NBC would have been the true start of a long-lasting career. Unfortunately, it went the other way. Frida Payne and Helen Reddy, they did the presentation, gave me my award. It was time for me to speak and say thank you. Well, at the time, when I went up there to say thank you, I thanked my father, I thanked my husband for being at home with the kids. But most of all, I give all praise and thanks to Allah. Not thinking, not even knowing NBC is a Jewish station, people, the presidents and everybody, everybody's, you know, they don't want to hear Allah. Islam was, you know, a taboo thing. I'm raised in a black community, and in our community, Allah was the God to give your praise and thanks to. And if it wasn't that, it was a witness, and you would call him Jehovah. And if you were from the island, we call him Jah. And after I said it, and I left the stage, and everybody was going down the escalators, and M. Tume was coming up the escalator, and he was laughing, and he called my name out. And he said, Sharon, are you Muslim? I said, no. And that's haunted me ever since, because I wasn't Muslim, but I wanted to give God the glory. And I called him Allah. And that was uh, the beginning of my black ball of my career. A lot of people don't know that, and a lot of people won't admit it. But if you ever try to find the tapes of that sixth annual Rhythm and Blues show held in Las Vegas, you won't find it. You won't find those archives. They buried it so deep. They buried that right along with my career. And just like that, Sharon Brown's career went up in smoke and faded as quickly as it emerged. She would release a slew of singles, including her cover of Sissy Houston's Love Don't Hurt People, You Got Me Where I Want to Be, and I'll Make You Feel Like the First Time, the latter under her own record label, TASS. All of them failed to make an impact. The aftermath of Specialized left Sharon to avoid the record altogether for a long period of her life. I went through a thing where I had to shut Specialize off. I'm not at a gig, I'm not at rehearsal, I'm at home, or I'm up visiting. I don't want the record on, I don't want to hear it, because every time the record would play, it would trigger me, because I was connected to that song. My soul, body, my mind, I, I don't know how it happened, but I became connected to the song to the point that I couldn't sleep if it was playing in a distance and it was playing in rotation all over New York. You could be in your bed and somebody's car would ride by and have it on and you'd hear it. You know what I'm saying? You'd always hear it when it was in rotation and that starts to be, it's no longer happy, joyous, look at me, I'm on the radio. It's more like, oh my God, oh my God, I don't want to go into the store. I don't want nobody to know that's me. I don't want nobody to know that's me. She had been absent from live concerts and opted to dedicate quality time to raise her family. But during the past 10 years, she's been able to rise above and play her music for her fans with the help of booking agents and friends Michelle Licata, and Michael Jacobs. At 73 years old, Sharon Brown wants nothing to do with the record industry. She is a free agent and is more eager to release her music independently via a mailing list of private fans than to deal with a label ever again. I don't have to be the gloved one. I don't have to be Beyonce. I don't have to be Jay-Z. I don't have to be Cardi B. I don't have to be that. If my music can get to you and you like the music, 
we can communicate direct. I'll keep giving you the music that way, but I won't do a record deal. I won't do a distribution deal. I won't do an NFT deal. I won't do any kind of deal with this industry, none. If I can, I'm gonna find a way before I leave this planet to actually live off the grid. I think that's the best way for me to live with what I feel about the system under which I live. I haven't committed 100% to my music career. I have not, I admit that 100%. If I had, I would have been a lot further in my career now and a lot more accolades and money and all whole nine yards that comes with it. But who knows what state of mind I would have been in? Who knows if I would have made it through the drug era? Who knows if I would have made it through alcohol? Who knows if I would have made it through? We don't know that, but I feel as though I made the right decision. My advice to my children and anyone else, it's mainly to teach them and advise them to stay independent. It's a longer road, it's a harder battle, but to own your creative work is important. At least be compensated for it if you're in the game, if that's what you're in it for. But the game is rigged. It has been from the beginning. It hasn't changed, it's just gotten worse. So an independent artist for me is the only way to go if you love music or whatever it is, actually, whatever you're trying to do, whatever your project is, I believe you should stay independent as long as you possibly can, at least bring it to the level where you, you can sell it off and make some sort of profit. Sharon's currently working in the hip hop arena for the first time with support from her older son, who goes by the stage name of Nam Viet. She's also developing an idea for reality TV production called Second Shot, which aims to bring artists of her era back into the spotlight. Four decades after I Specialize in Love shot to the very top, Sharon Brown looks back and believes she's made a major contribution to the industry. Though she realizes the business is not what it's all cracked up to be, the singer is truly grateful for being a part of an experience that has defined people's lives forever. I'm in a state of gratitude for all the people that was behind Specialized in Love when it started. We had no idea it was going to be a hit, but a certain amount of people came together Unknown artists, unknown record company, an unknown management company, unknown songwriters, just everybody unknown on the public level. But in the industry, we knew each other. We knew what we were doing over at CBS, what we did over here, stuff like that. That's how I found I Specialize in Love. I'm thankful that the spirit guided me. I'm thankful that I listened. I'm thankful that I was able to maintain my humanness. I'm thankful that I was able to maintain love for myself and for everyone still in the midst of a storm. I can still smile and meet the sunrise, you know, with joy and, and carry it to other people regardless of how they're feeling. You either receive it or you don't. It's not my job to worry about that, but I will keep spreading love and joy and sunshine because we need it. Thanks to Sharon Brown for her valuable contribution to this episode. And of course, thank you for listening. This episode was produced and hosted by yours truly, Diego Martinez. Our executive producer is Nicholas Nick Fresh Buzo, and our audio engineer is Adam Fogel. Follow Tunes all over social media on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at TunesPod. That is C H O O N S. POD. Please rate us and give us a review on Apple Podcasts, as it will help other folks discover our content. And subscribe wherever you get your podcast. Join us once more for a deep dive on much loved songs and a breakdown on their legacy on the next episode of Tunes. <laughs>